That's my time. <laughs> that noise cause anyone else to flinch a little bit? I know when I hear my alarm clock sound uh, outside of context, it reminds me of that feeling that I feel every morning when I hear it. I go, ooh, it reminds me of my least favorite part of the day, uh, waking up. <laughs> How many of you would consider yourselves morning people? Okay, I, listen to me. You need to understand how much of a gift that really is. Because the rest of us in this room, that's, you know we have a 915 service? <laughs> that's, the rest of us are here at 11 because we, we cannot do 915. Uh, if you don't believe me, take a look at this. This is my alarm clock app. Um, I'm, I'm serious. Screenshot, because I know if I just set my alarm at 5, I'm going to hit stop, and then I'm going to go back to bed. <laughs> um, I struggle every morning to wake up and fight myself to get out of bed. <laughs> I, I, you're still processing, I know. It's okay. <laughs> but then, you know, after about three or four alarms have gone off, I allow my mind to wander to the reason that I've set whatever early alarm it is. Uh, my responsibilities for the day. Uh, I think about being late or not fulfilling my commitments, and that provides me the motivation to get out of bed. And we've all had to do this. We know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all, whether it's getting out of bed or something else, had to coax ourselves to do the things that we don't want to do, but we know that we need to do. As part of the men's leadership class for the last uh, six, five, six months, um, I don't think it's been that long, the past several months, every Saturday morning, I've met with four guys. One of those men is Rick DeBoost, who many of you know. He serves as an elder at our church. Many of you know that he had some serious health complications a few years ago that required him to change his lifestyle. So every Saturday morning, the th other three of us men, we order bacon, eggs, hash browns, a nice breakfast quiche. Uh, and Rick, every Saturday morning, doesn't matter where we go, will consistently order the same thing. A nice, firm, hearty loaf of oatmeal. <laughs> Rick hates oatmeal. So why does Rick order oatmeal? Rick gets oatmeal because oatmeal is the better choice for Rick. Rick is devoted to his family. Rick is devoted to his life. His devotion is stronger than his emotion. So what Rick does with us every Saturday morning, it, it's exactly what David is doing in Psalm 103. Go ahead and open up Psalm chapter 103. Here's a trick. If you open up to exactly halfway through your Bible, you should land somewhere in the Psalms, and then you can do the math to figure out the rest to get you to 103. We don't know exactly when David wrote this Psalm, but most think it was likely after the big kerfuffle that he had with you know, Uriah and his wife Bathsheba. Because, most scholars believe this, because David has this observable appreciation for grace throughout the whole entire psalm. And with that in mind, we look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The first thing that we learn from David here is to command yourself to praise. That should be your first blank there. Command yourself to praise. Uh, look at this. Who is David addressing in these verses? His soul. <laughs> He's talking to himself. He says the word bless. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, there are many Old Testament words for both bless and praise, and we could spend a lot of time on all of them. But the one that is used here meant to humbly submit oneself before God. So David, in talking to himself, he says, Ditch your pride, soul. Submit yourself before God. In these two verses, I see David teaching us three things. The first thing that I see David teaching us is to pursue devotion over emotion. What David believes with his mind, what he knows he ought to do, he knows he ought to bless the Lord, what he believes with his mind, he then commands his heart to do. The immature human tendency is to allow the desires of our hearts to influence what we believe with our minds. Hey, take a look at this picture. Uh, as you can see, we've got 
a train. Um, and most of us know how trains work. You've got the engine, and then the rest of the train is pulled by the engine. What most people do is we put emotion in the driver's seat of our train, and we allow our devotion to follow behind. So whatever, whatever we feel, we allow that to drive, and then whatever we think about, whatever we believe, that follows behind the engine. What David is doing is the opposite. What David has done is he said, no, this is what I know to be true and what I believe and what I want to do. I'm fully devoted to God. That is my, that is my engine. I'm going to allow my emotions to submit to that and follow along. What David believes with his heart, with his mind, he commands his heart to do. His first choice will be to bless the Lord. His emotions will follow where he first places his devotion. So David is teaching us to pursue devotion over emotion. How do we do this? Well, David shows us that we should praise God first for who God is. Look at this. Right in verse 1, David says, Bless his holy name. The name of the Lord used in verse 1 is Yahweh, which is the Jewish proper name for God. Encompassed in that, that one name is all of God's character. There are many names used in the Old Testament to describe the attributes of God. We could spend all morning on just those. But here's some. Some include El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai, our Master. Jehovah Ra, our Shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Healer. El Elam, the Everlasting God. So why do we praise him? Because all these things are true of him. That's, that's who God is. We praise God because of who God is. But David also shows us in verse 2 to praise God for what God does. In verse 2, you can see David instructs himself, forget not all his benefits. Hey, soul, don't forget all the things that God does for you as well. Uh, th there's so many examples that we could give for this, but re really we don't need to because that's what David does the rest of the psalm as he lists out all of these things that God has done for him, for his nation, and really for us as children of God. In addition to commanding yourself to praise, David displays that you should also remind yourself of why God deserves praise. In verses 3 through 5, we see Look at this. Forget not all his benefits, he who forgives all your iniquities, he who heals all your diseases, he who redeems your life from destruction, he who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, he who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Think about that. All these things that defined your life Sin, disease, destruction, and God has flipped all of those on their heads and instead given you forgiveness and healing and restoration. That's called redemption. And he completely deserves our praise for all of that. But it's not just that. We also see in verses 6 and 7 that our God gives justice. And we want this, don't we? I mean, all of us have this inner sense of justice that's raging. In fact, in Romans 8, Paul says that all creation groans like the groans of childbirth for God to restore all things, which explains so many of the loud cries that we hear in our, in our world for, for justice to prevail. Since sin has entered the world, all of creation has desired the justice that only God can give and provide. And David says God gives this to the oppressed and to, and to Israel. Take a look at this. Verses 6 and 7, he says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Now, we are not, we are not Israel. But as we have been learning in our journey through Exodus, what we learn about the character of God in the story of the Israelites, we know is still true of the character of God our Father today. 
if we can see that our God provided justice for his people in the face of Pharaoh's oppression, then we can trust that God will bring justice into the situations tainted by sin today. It's how he's always worked. Our God always has given justice, and he's totally worth praising for that. And lastly, in verses 8 through 12, we see that God gives grace. Take a look. David writes, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor has he punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Our church is named Community. We live in blank college town. We are part of the Charis Fellowship of Churches, which Charis is the Greek word for uh, you guys are great. Uh, yes, grace. We like grace. Let's not allow the fact that we are constantly surrounded by this concept to take away the, the absolute awe that we should be filled with when we consider the grace of our Lord. Our Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Now take a look at this globe. It's a pretty nice globe. Think about directions for a second, right? We are somewhere here-ish. Yeah, right there. If I start heading north, I can head north for a while until I reach about right here. Once I, once I get here, the only way that I can go is south, any direction. I, I've, I've reached maximum north. But I'm right here. Let's say I'm right here, and I start, I start heading I start heading east, right? I just keep going east. I'm still going east. When does east become west? I can go east eternally. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed your iniquities, your sins from you. That's how far God has separated you from the bondage of your sin. That's called grace. God gives grace, and he's totally worth praising for that. So what do we do with that? Well, step one, we receive this grace. Perhaps you're sitting here, you don't feel redeemed. I talk about how God gives redemption, but you feel destroyed. Or or you feel oppressed, and you, you know you need grace. You were born into a world where your sins and your decisions and your ability, those things are your name. And God wants to separate that from you as far as the east is from the west and offer you grace and forgiveness instead. If you've never received that, would you today? And if you do, would you let someone here know immediately? We'd love to celebrate that with you. Secondarily, here's what you can do. Pursue devotion over emotion. Every morning, my alarm clock goes off so early because I've devoted my mornings to the Lord. I just know if I don't do it in the first thing in the morning, I'm, I'm going to let my day go by and then I'm going to get tired and it's not going to happen. I've devoted my morning times to the Lord. So I, I get up after about three or four alarms. I get up, I go to my living room, I, I sit on my couch, I open my journal, I write down a prayer. I prayed for many of you in that journal. Uh, and I spend time in scripture. I hate mornings, uh, but my devotion to the Lord trumps my emotion. And listen, when I, place, when I place my devotion fully in the Lord, my emotions do follow. They always do. W one final thought. Uh, we gather every week on Sunday mornings, and we do much together. But the one thing that we all physically do together at the same time every week is when we gather is, is praise. Why, why is that? Because God loves it. 
The New Testament tells us over and over and over how much God loves to hear his children sing. Sometimes I don't want to sing. In fact, sometimes a church band sounds like my 5 a.m. alarm. Uh, but then I remind myself of, of all that we've just discussed, and I'm compelled to submit myself humbly before God. And I let the melody leave my mouth. I let the, I let the praises leave my mouth. What if, what if that was our attitude walking into our gatherings? Our gatherings would be celebratory and joy-filled. And in those acts of humble submission, starting here, we train ourselves to live this way in all of our decision-making, always. Consistently submitting ourselves humbly before the Lord. I want that. I think many of us do as well. Let's pray. God, thanks for this morning. God, thanks uh, for your word. It's just, it's all right there, who you are and, and all that you've done. And God, we stand in awe of it. God, thanks that we have it, we have access to it. And God, may we be changed by it. Would you fill our hearts with awe and wonder and gratitude and humility before you? Let those things become the entirety of who we are and help us to walk and grow in all those things. God, help us to choose to bless you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.